Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much to the organizers for being so kind to invite me to speak here. And thank you to all of you for still being here for the last talk of the session. And um, so I was asked to speak about the microbiome and if there's such a thing as a good and a bad microbiome and if there is, does it matter at all? And I'm hoping that by the end of my talk I can convince you that the microbiome is important and that it's something you need to consider and that actually does matter. So um, I would like to start with a few definitions of terms that you will be hearing throughout my talk. Um, first of all, the microbiota, which is, uh, or are communities of microorganisms, and they consist of bacteria, archaea, eukaryons, and viruses. And the entirety of those microorganisms is called the microbiome, and that is those entirety that is found in a given habitat at a given point in time, let's say as a human host, for example. And another very important term is dysbiosis. You will hear me say that a lot in the, in the next 20 to 25 minutes. This is when an imbalance in those microbial communities is happening. And this is mainly characterized by a change in quantity and quality of the composition of the microbiota itself. So, a um, little bit of history, microorganisms were discovered by a uh, Dutch businessman, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, which I pronounced probably completely wrong, and um, he uh, developed the microscope, which then enabled him to um, do further uh, examinations, and he actually was the first one who discovered um, bacteria. And about 200 years later, a Russian zoologist, Ilya Mechnikov, um, discovered that certain microorganisms in your gut can have a positive effect on your health. And he was also the first one that described dysbiosis as an apparition of those microbial communities. And he was the first to hypothesize that this could be actually triggering a range of different diseases. And around the same time, um, Alexander Fleming uh, discovered um, the penicillium, and among many other things, this also led to the observation that if you disrupt your intestinal microbiota by antibiotics, um, you are more prone to infections with pathobiont bacteria that then actually are causing problems. And it was also suggested that the manipulation of the microbiota could present an important therapeutic option. So um, this just goes to show that the importance of the microbiome was discovered relatively early. But who has ever worked with microorganisms and knows that classifying uh, bacteria is actually a very tedious, or was a very tedious job, because it in, uh, included in vitro culturing and an array of metabolic and biochemical tests. But that was resolved by the high throughput 16S rRNA sequencing uh, technique, which makes identifying bacteria very, very easy. And um, I just wanted to give you a quick overview how, uh, how this is working. So let's say you want to look at the vaginal or the rectal microbiome, you can use an array of different samples. You can use swabs, you can use lavages, you can use the mucus that you're collecting with a soft cap, you can use biopsies, or the easiest, you can use stool. So from all of those samples, you extract your DNA, and then you amplify the bacterial 16S rRNA gene, which is highly conserved within bacterial species. So this is then giving you the way to identify whatever you have in the mix. Then you add a um, Illumina-based sequencing step, you do some analysis, and then you get your microbiome composition. So um, just don't be fooled by this little analysis here. This is actually a very complex process. You need a bioinformatician that helps you with that. And because those data are in incredibly complex, so it, it's not very easy to do this analysis. And however, when you're done with it, you are getting this taxonomic tree of life for every species you have in the mix. And in general, you know, if you then look at the microbiome, what is reported is the phylum and the genus. So whenever you know I'm showing you data, this is what um, that's referring to in the taxonomic tree of life. 
and um, you need to make those huge amount of data that you're getting from the microbiome some way digestible and those are two plots that you're seeing quite frequently when you look at microbiome data. So on the left hand side this is an abundance plot that also gives you diversity and each of those columns is standing for one sample and the color in each of those columns is representing a bacteria. So you can see as you go from the left to the right in that plot that you're increasing your different species in one sample which is also then increasing your diversity. And the plot on the right hand side, that's a principal component analysis, which is basically giving you the distance between different bacterial communities so that you can say they are actually uh, uh, compositionally different. And what this one is showing you is, for example, that the microbiome in the human host is clustering by anatomic sites. So this is representing the microbiome of the gut. This is the one of the oral cavity, and down here you have the skin and the vaginal microbiome. So that tells you you have different compositions in those different anatomical sites. And with this, I would like to go back to the human host who actually harbors different microbiomes. It's the oral microbiome, the skin microbiome, the digestive tract microbiome, as well as the urogenital microbiome. And in a healthy host, when those microbiomes are in a balance, um, they're actually beneficiary to the host, but um, as you heard before, bacteria can also go bad, and then that can have serious consequences for the host. And um, the Clostridium difficile infection is a good example to look at that. So let's say your intestinal microbiome is a little bit out of whack because you just had an antibiotic therapy. So if you then ingest spores from Clostridium difficile, you get a pluming of that bacteria because your commensals are not really keeping them in check and protecting you. And then you develop a dysbiosis, which leads to severe diarrhea, inflammation, cell death, and colitis. So the treatment of choice is then antibiotics, but that is not killing only the clostridium, it's also killing your good gut microbiota. And in case you have an uh, um, incomplete uh, resolution or killing of the clostridium, you're entering this vicious cycle where the clostridium is kind of like, you know, flaring up over and over again. Um, and to escape the uh, cycle, what um, people did, they uh, did a, what, what they call a fecal transplant, where you giving the microbiome from a healthy person to a person that was infected with clostridium, and you can see that uh, the uh, resolution of the symptoms and a restoration of a healthy uh, a gut mucosa, or a gut microbiome. So this is just one example, but there are many other diseases that are connected with microbial dysbiosis. And since this is an HIV meeting and I'm working in HIV, I would like to focus on um, vaginal dysbiosis as well as gut dysbiosis and how this is playing a role in HIV transmission and HIV pathogenesis. So let's start with the vaginal microbiome and how this is contributing to HIV transmission. So on the left-hand side, you have a healthy uh, vaginal environment. This is lactobacillus dominant, and which keeps the pH low, and you have an intact mucosa. If you develop a dysbiosis, you see a shift to a more polymicrobial environment, which is rich in anaerobic bacteria like Gardnerella and Prevotella. Those bacteria are anti uh, inflammatory, which is then leading through different processes to barrier damages. And this, this, const uh, uh, this is connected to HIV transmission. So in general, if you look at the vaginal microbiome, it can be separated in four distinct community types, and they are different in composition. So community type one and two are lactobacillus dominant, while then if you look at community type three and four, that's when you look at more at this um, polymicrobial environment that is um, Prevotella and Gardnerella rich. And um, 
the vagina or this diversity, or this is diverse across ethnicity. So it's not as the same in every woman. It depends on where you live and where you're coming from. So for example, um, the community type three is what is prevalent in America, African Americans and Hispanic women, while in white Caucasian women, you mainly see community type one, and in Asian women, you mainly see community type three. So, um, and in this study in South African women, they actually connected the, community, the vaginal community type with uh, risk of HIV infection. And what they did, if you follow, they followed those women, they separated them in different community types and then followed them over two years. And what you can see quite impressively that those women with the community type one, they did have no, they had no HIV infections. While if you move to community type two, three, and four, you see an increased risk of HIV transmission. So the question is, why does uh, uh, vaginal dysbiosis uh, increase the risk of, uh, of HIV infection? And probably the most prominent factor here is that the dysbiosis is uh, associated with inflammation. And um, Nikki Klatt showed that uh, quite nicely that um, in women with bacterial vaginosis, you have an increase in um, cervical vaginal neutrophils, which are the cells that are erecting first against bacterial infection. A second factor is that dysbiotic vaginal bacteria reduce the epithelial barrier integrity. And again, this is, a, as I think, a very elegant uh, uh, experiment to show that. You kind of like crow a layer of epithelial cells on a surface, you scratch it, and in a normal abiotic environment, within 24 hours, the layer is growing uh, together again. If you add the supernatant of lactobacillus um, inners, which is more well, community type one dominant uh, 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 vaginal environment, you see the same thing. After 24 hours, the, the, the epithelial barrier is closed again. However, if you add the supernatant of Gardnerella, after 24 hours, you still you know, have this gap. So there's something that those bacteria produce that is hampering uh, uh, the epithelial barrier integrity. And another factor that we're just starting to understand is that those vaginal communities are also functionally different. So they having using different pathways, they're having different metabolites, and that's very likely also playing a role in this whole mix. And to go one step further, this is a newer study where they showed that the effectiveness of PrEP is, or the, the variable effectiveness of PrEP is partly due to the vaginal um, microbiome. So if you look at PrEP studies in women, um, you see varying results with, with zero efficacy to 80% efficacy. And the first thing, of course, that comes to mind is, okay, that's because of adherence. But there's actually very little known about the biological factors that might play a role in here. And it turns out that the microbiome is could potentially be very important here. So what the researcher did, they um, looked in Caprisa 004, which is a study done in South African women uh, to assess the safety and effectiveness of tenofovir for HIV prevention. And they separated the women in those with the lactobacillus dominant um, vaginal uh, microbiome and those with the Gardnerella dominant. Uh, um, uh, microbiome. So one is community type one, and the other one is more community type four. And if you then look at the effectiveness of tenofovir, the results are quite striking. So on the left hand side, those are the women with a lactobacillus dominant microbiome. The effectiveness is 61%. While in those ones that are having a Gardnerella dominant microbiome, the effectiveness is only 18%. So Something in the microbiome is probably, you know, responsible for this different uh, efficacy. And what is happening is that Gardnerella is actually rapidly depleting the tenofovir. And um, if you look at the full change of tenofovir levels in an abiotic environment, 
you don't see any changes. If you do it in the presence of lactobacillus, there are no changes either. However, if you do it in the presence of gardnerella, you see a drop in the tenofovir levels. So, and you see the same thing if you then look at the bacteria themselves. So in the bacteria, or in, in, in lactobacillus, you will not find tenofovir, while actually uh, Gardnerella is taking up the tenofovir and metabolizing it. And they showed it in another set of experiments that they're then actually excreting the metabolites which have no therapeutic effect anymore. So I think this is a very striking example where the microbiome has direct effect on HIV and HIV prevention. And with that, I would just like to briefly talk also about the gut microbiome and how that is playing into HIV pathogenesis. So um, compared to the vaginal microbiome, uh, with the gut microbiome, high bacterial diversity means a healthy gut. So you want a high diversity in the gut, while in the vaginal microbiome, you really want this lactobacillus dominant uh, environment. And this is just one study that is showing that for the gut, also quite impressive. They looked at um, allogenic stem cell transplantation, and they could show that the survival rate of those patients was much better if they had a high diverse uh, gut microenvironment. And um, <clears throat> similar to the um, vaginal microbiome, also the gut microbiome is clustering by population. So you have this cluster here, which are the Malawians and American Indians, and these are the white Caucasians. So it's also depending on where you're coming from and where you live. Um, what is different with the gut microbiome is that the diversity increases and changes with age. So the um, small graph down here, this is actually infants from zero to three, where you see a quite striking change in the gut microbiome due to the change uh, in diet. However, this is not stopping. So as you get older, and this is just the, the age range, you kind of like increase your diversity in the gut microbiome, and this is independent from where you're coming. This is a, a general thing about the gut microbiome. So another important thing, if you talk about the gut, that you need to keep in mind, gut doesn't equal gut, because the gut is a, uh, huge system with different functions, and due to those different functions, it also harbors different bacteria. So on the right-hand side, you see that depending on where you're sampling from, you're getting different communities. So in blue, that are stool samples. In um, purple, these are samples from um, a colonic lavage. And in red and in yellow, these are the microbiome that you find on biopsies. So. This just goes to show if you look at the gut microbiome, you need to ask yourself, okay, what population is it from and where did they sample from? And this is important when you are comparing different studies because you can get quite different results uh, depending on, on those parameters. Um, coming back to HIV, um, what people found relatively early that uh, HIV is associated with an alteration of the gut microbiome. And one of the first observations was that, um, so this is the zero negatives, these are chronically infected and chronically treated. With HIV infection, you're losing bacteroides, which are kind of like, so to speak, good bacteria, and you increase your abundance of Prevotella. So that was one of the first observation that was attributed to the HIV infection. Um, however, a more recent study said, okay, also maybe sexual preferences might link to those changes that you're seeing in the gut microbiome. And what they did, they, in a, um, in a cohort in Barcelona where they collected stool samples and looked for the stool microbiome, they included HIV negative and HIV positive patients, but also stratified them by risk groups. So they looked at heterosexual, separated them in heterosexuals, MSM, and intravenous drug users. And as you can see on the left plot, they're not clustering by H the, mi the gut microbiome is not clustering by HIV status, it's clustering by risk behavior. So you have the MSM on the one side, and then you have the um, heterosexuals and the intravenous drug users on the other side. And if you dissect it a little bit further, you can actually see that there is a dysbiosis by risk group. So if 
you look at the bacteroidetes that you kind of like well, first thinking you lose over the course of HIV, those are very, um, or they, those are the most abundant group in the heterosexuals and the intravenous drug users, which is the red and the blue, while you do not see them very much in, uh, in MSM. If you look at the Prevotella abundance, it's the other way around. So you have a high abundance of Prevotella in MSM, while you do not see those ones um, in the heterosexuals or in the intravenous drug users. And this is just going, and this, I think there is a consensus that there is a change due to HIV in the gut microbiome, but this study showed very clearly that you also need to stratify your cohorts by risk behavior because that clearly also has an, uh, uh, an influ influence on the gut microbiome. And um, I could show you many more studies that are all giving, if it comes to the gut microbiome and HIV, varying uh, uh, results, but probably because it's such a vast majority of data you look at but one thing is consistent if it comes to the gut microbiome and HIV, and that's that you are losing your diversity in HIV. So, and that this is also then frequently connected to different um, uh, disease, uh, different, different. Um, <laughs> to, to different effects, or this has an effect. Um, of, of HIV-related um, diseases, and the most important one, and the one that I would like to briefly talk about, is the immune activation, because you know that immune activation is an ind independent marker of um, uh, disease progression, and um, the gut microbiome is actually playing an important role here. So um, this is a very simplified uh, 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 scheme of what we think is happening. And um, so due to the HIV infection, you develop a dysbiosis. So you decrease your immune regulatory bacteria while you increase your pathobionts, which then causing inflammation, which then in turn needs to a permeability of the gut mucosa. That then enables those pathobiont bacteria and bacterial products to translocate into the lamina propria where they at first activate innate immune cells that then start uh, uh, to continue to, or that then contribute to inflammation, but they're also activating dendritic cells that then in turn activate CD4 T cells uh, to proliferate, which is providing more targets for the virus. But uh, an, among those CD4 T cells, there are Th17 and Th22 cells, which are actually uh, contributing to the homeostasis of the gut uh, mucosa. But if those ones deplete, are depleted, that then again fuels the mucosal breakdown, and you're entering this vicious cycle where then in the end this is uh, fueling the, the, the dysbiosis more. And there are many factors that are uh, contributing to this also like diet, sexual behavior as we have seen, but also RIT. But the most important thing is that it's thought now that this process is also continuing um, under antiretroviral treatment and that this is actually contributing to the immune activation you're seeing um, in HIV. And last, I would like to just show you the first microbiota or some of the first microbiota data from RV254, the acutely HIV infected cohort here in, in Bangkok. And that work is done by Irene Seretti and or Ornella Sortino. And um, I just want to highlight briefly two things. So one thing is, if you compare HIV negative, acutely infected, and acutely infected under ART, you see this high abundance of Prevotella in all of them, which is also supporting the hypothesis of the Barcelona study uh, that this is probably due to sexual or to risk behavior because, as you know, RV254 is mainly um, MSM. And there's a second change we are seeing in acute HIV infection, which is the reduction of the abundance of Firmicutes in acute HIV infection and um, or which remains under ART. So we don't really know what that means at this point, so there are additional uh, um, 
uh, investigations ongoing where um, our colleagues at the NIH are looking at the metabolome, which is, you know, what kind of metabolites are those bacteria producing and how this, you know, could, you know, contribute to a dysbiosis or to immune activation. And um, in summary, what I hope that I could show you is that the microbiome is its very own, very complex ecosystem that really needs to be taken care of. It's, it's a little bit like gardening. So if it's devastated by antibiotics or by HIV infection and you just leave it alone, you have potentially pathobion bacteria, you know, running wild there. So you need to support the microbiome in its recovery and there are certain ways as, uh, you can do that. So one I already mentioned is the transplant, um, which in certain contexts has shown successes, but then also what is currently done a lot in the, in the community are targeted probiotic therapies. And here again, we're seeing varying success from studies that are showing actually probiotics reduce neuroinflammation and in, um, uh, uh, are beneficial for the neurocognition to studies in um, adults that have started um, RT as well as probiotic at the chronic phase of infection where they concluded they'd see no benefit um, of the additional probiotics to another study in children where they actually uh, saw a reduction in immune activation in the arm uh, where probiotics were given. So I think the varying uh, uh, results we are getting here is really because we are looking under different conditions in different study populations and there are many more studies coming out that are hopefully, you know, looking more into detail and just de can demonstrate how probiotics potentially can help. And with that, I would like to thank the people that supported and mentored me here in Thailand, Mark, Jintana, and Sandy. And I especially would like to thank Nikki Klatt from the University of Miami, who I learned a lot when we started to be interested in the microbiome, and who also provided some of the slides and data for the presentation you just saw. And I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I hope that I could convince you that the microbiome actually does matter. Thank you. Thank you.